so yes, this is about reception action, uh, obviously, and that was as part of my personal history, because when we were uh, working, uh, colleagues and, and I in, in the, the group of friends in the Max Planck in Munich, we were struggling with uh, the, the, well, back then, a uh, standard way to look at uh, human information processing, which was pretty much like this, and I'm afraid that it still looks like this, because when I set up the the Leiden Cognitive Psychology program, uh, I looked at almost all textbooks that were available for introduction to cognitive psychology, and they pretty much still look like this, uh, including the, the organization of the chapters and so forth. So not only is uh, often uh, any uh, mentioning of action missing, as uh, David has complained in a Cinderella paper uh, very prominently, I think, uh, but even if you look closer, even if there are is, let's say, if, if there is action featured, uh, there were a couple of issues that were, were had trouble with, uh, and one is the personal experience. Uh, the idea is still this is very cognitive, <coughs> obviously. Um, so, in, in the sense that there are internal processing stages that are considered, so that's different from behaviorism. And yet, what has been uh, inherited from behaviorism is the idea that it is the stimulus that that triggers everything that follows. It is never me or my action that actually produces stuff, which is. I don't know about your life, but my life is different. Uh, I'm typically initiating things. Uh, even if I watch TV, it is me who switches on the TV who, who cho chooses the channel. Uh, and if I don't like it, I do other input uh, for me. Uh, and so uh, we were not happy with this. Uh, the other is that I was involved in a number of robot projects. Uh, and then you see that active vision, the idea that once you have the, the robot now stand still and wait for input, but let him move and do stuff and, and explore the environment, then many problems that were big problems before are now <coughs> resolved. And so active making vision active actually uh, seems to be so much more natural and, and, and uh, um, circumvent many problems that the people on the ways are, otherwise are facing. We were also busy with stimulus response compatibility phenomena like you them in the um, Simon effect or stimulus response compatibility effect <coughs> proper or the, the Stroop effect, uh, Ericsson and so forth and so on. And uh, the, the idea that there is a fixed uh, sequence of stages uh, that you have to run through doesn't seem to, to give you any idea about why there are privilege loops, why there are uh, direct more intimate and less intimate relationships between some stimuli and some actions like affordances, some, some people would say, uh, some stimuli are just directly informing actions, whereas others are just only indicating them. And that is, seems to be difficult to, to squeeze into such a model. Uh, and other stuff that I will be briefly uh, flashing here. So what we came up with is, is in a nutshell, is this. Uh, in the beginning, uh, to decide to it uh, is the act. Uh, so in the beginning, there's always some motor activity you're busy with, and that is, uh, certainly true for uh, perception, because if I would not move my finger systematically across the surface, there would, was, would be very little I can say about the, the characteristics of that surface, how it looks, how it feels like, what structure it might have, and so forth and so on. The same is true for eyes. If I, of course, once I have a fixated particular location, then you can uh, present me stuff out of nowhere and, and back to nowhere, like in the lab, which is not particularly ecological, uh, but normally it is me who determines what the input would be because I turn around and I make my selections. I may not yet know exactly what it is, but I, I do know that this is interesting for me right now and this is why I'm learning this, right? Uh, so we are the two choosers and without active, uh, uh, let's say, interactions with our environment, there would be very little input we would, uh, we would get. So, that this is perception. So you create an event or you change the relationship uh, between you and your environment. That is fed back. That has uh, reafferent uh, consequences, as it were. So your internal, you get uh, input back from what changed and how it changed, and that is coded in terms of you may call that perceptual codes. This is why they are labeled with P. Uh, so that is features as feature-based approach, so that may uh, inform you that this is green and, and round, uh, moving in, in this direction, and so forth and so forth. So these are the features of the event that you are <coughs> exposed to or 
exposure zone. Now that has to be related to the action without uh, have, taking into consideration that I have turned right before having David on my right and now. I wouldn't have any understanding about what right mean and right to left mean. So I have to, to, to consider what I did in order to have that input, in order to make sense of the input. That means that I have to relate the two, the motor act and the perceptual consequence. Now this is a perception, this is a perceptual act. Now you may wonder, and how does an action work like? This is about cognition and action. This, uh, well, obviously if I act, uh, I perform a motor uh, act that has, that changes the relationship between me and the environment, and that has reafferent consequences. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't know whether I achieve what I wanted to achieve. Now then you might say, well, apart from relabeling those and recoloring those models. Uh, this is pretty much the same thing you tell, you're telling here, and this is exactly our story. So we're not saying that perception action is related. We're not saying they are interwoven and heavily interacting. We are saying this is a semantic mistake to consider these two things different. This is just we often use different different terms to refer to the same event. Some people may say, oh, this is this event is the uh, the, 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 the pr very promising for the workless steel worker. Other people may find the same event the biggest mistake in the, in the history of a country. So there are different ways to refer to the same event and we're used to that because we, why are we doing this? We emphasize different aspects. Now if I refer to the same act as perception, then I emphasize the, the input producing aspect of if I carry, if I call the same thing an action, I, I emphasize the, the relation changing aspect. Now, is that a contra contradiction? Not at all. It's just a different emphasis. So perception action does not need to be bridged. Do not need to be bridged. They are the same thing. Okay. So this is what that would be lame uh, as a story. So we added some more here in, in a nutshell with the assumptions that perceptual events and planned actions are cognitively represented by effect. Event codes. These codes are integrated assemblies of feature codes, as you see here, that include perceptual and motor, so efferent and efferent aspects, if you will. Uh, and that means that these feature codes can be understood as cognitive or brain states, depending on your level of analysis. Uh, we don't care about that. That are correlated with external features, whether perceived or produced. So the coding, uh, as Wolfgang Prince has, has emphasized, is distal. We are always referring to the the, the, the characteristics of the thing in the world, uh, whether it is something that we perceive or something that we produce. Now, these feature codes are therefore sensory motor entities because they have different and different aspects to them. Uh, and so they serve for perception and for action planning at the same time, uh, depending on what you want. Okay, so that's the, the, the basic idea. Um, and if you are more interested in modeling in more detail, then we have some recent papers that may satisfy you a bit more than what I'm telling you here. Um, so let's let's play this through. What does it mean? Let's start with something trivial that that all that every model can do or has to do, namely priming. What, what how does that work? Priming and perception action context. Well, take something like the Simon effect. Uh, so you do have a somehow more or less direct activation of responses, people say, uh, through stimulus location. How does that work in the model? Let's assume you have a compatible situation like here, where you have to press uh, left for a red circle, and the circle is uh, appearing on the left, whereas here you press right for a green circle, uh, so and here the, the stimulus is still on the left, that would be an incompatible condition. That needs to, uh, that's a, a delay is reaction. Now the idea would be that this circle is coded like this. Uh, it is red, it is left, and F2 stands for any other feature that you may think of that it, it, that it has. Uh, and uh, you see that the action plan has also many features. It may be fast, it may be accurate, it may be whatever, plus it has the feature of being left because this is how it is defined in the instruction and, this, and also through, let's say it's defined through the alternative action uh, that is available, and you see that there is no 
not actually a feature overlap, there is an identity, identity sharing. So they're the same, the very same feature is involved in both in the action plan and in the stimulus, and therefore uh, priming, and priming is actually explained by uh, identity, by partial identity. And that is obviously not the case in the, uh, in the incompatible condition where there is no feature overlap uh, whatsoever uh, unless you grade it uh, and, and therefore uh, there is less priming or no priming than there is on a smaller range. That's the, that's the basic method, right? Now, that's pretty late because, well, everyone has to do this if you're busy in this field. Well, what the, the theory also can do is something that not many uh, other kind of competitors can do, namely it can explain reverse effects uh, from action on perception. This is indeed what we, something we were busy with for quite a while. I'm just presenting a few uh, highlights here. One is for instance from a PRP effect, that is from dual task uh, control. Indeed, what, what people had to do is they were presented with, the, with one of those four stimuli in each uh, trial. Obviously, uh, they, there was color and shape that differed, and the two tasks were defined differently. The first was a key press, a left or right key press, not colored, this is just to guide you through, in response to the color of the stimulus. So whenever you see something red, you should press left. And if you see something blue, you press right. This is the first reaction in the, the dual task condition, right? The second was a verbal response, so you had to say red or green uh, if it was an H or an S. So obviously shape was relevant here, so you would say red whenever you see an H, whatever the color is. If you see, say green if you say if you see an S. Does that make sense? Now, what we were interested in here is not the PRP effect. There is a PRP effect. Yes, the second is uh, the reaction type is dramatically increased if you reduce the SOA between Stimuli. Here we actually used, uh, the, in this one, we used an SOA of zero, which often maximizes the effect. So you're much slower in the second uh, reaction. That's not surprising, but we're interested in reaction type one. Why? Well, let's assume you're busy with selecting this response. And let's assume you would then, you would press the right key in response to the green letter. You're processing a green letter. And let's say, you are also expected to say red. Red is not compatible with green. Okay. Now, you can have two ideas. Either dual tasking uh, in introduces sequential uh, action selection for processing. Uh, that's the general idea. Now then you would not expect any difference depending on the compatibility between the second response and the first stimulus. But if you are assuming that there is parallel processing going on, you would expect such an effect. You would expect that in the compatible conditions, like here and here, you find faster reaction time in the first half than in the second. And this is exactly what we found. So the second task is not so interesting. You see dramatic increase here. But the first task shows a very solid effect of the compatibility. Uh, between the second response and the primary stimulus. So obviously a single channel doesn't work here. Uh, and that was the first demonstration of this kind of backward compatibility effect, uh, basically undermining at least quite a number of aspects of the single channel. And that is uh, possible only if you uh, assume that uh, action, that, that say that the flow of information in this information processing stage system, uh, if it exists, can go, go both ways. All right, um, second feature of this uh, story, this theory, this theoretical story, this feature integration. Uh, and you might wonder why that is necessary at all. Well, uh, the feature integration problem has been uh, very clearly described by Treisman uh, and Singer uh, and, and from different angles. And the idea is that if you see a red rooster uh, and you activate features like red and rooster, in your cognitive system, there is nothing wrong with that. You, you don't need any binding if you, if you do this. The problem is that you are typically processing more than one stimulus at a time, or you may keep one active uh, that you may uh, want to remember. Now, if that is the case, if you also see a black hat at the same time, you wonder how the system knows that it is the rooster that was red and not black, and not 
account. So, um, how do features that are concurrently activated, how are they bound? Now there are different solutions to the system. As I suggest here, this is the Synchro solution. He says that uh, they, synchro, they are synchronized in time, so they, uh, they, the, the neurons coding them uh, are uh, going on and off, on and off, and on and off, in a rhythm that is different for the different objects, uh, so that the, the, the number of objects that you can keep, can keep uh, active at the same time is determined by the, the phase differences that the system can discriminate, and there are calculations that, given the 40 noise that might be about four, uh, tells us something. But anyway, uh, the idea is that there is some kind of binding uh, in one, one, one way or another that kind of keeps these things together. And the same goes for action. If you carry out several things at the same time, if you run hard and listen patiently at the same time, maybe difficult, but you're able to do this. Uh, if you, especially if you have uh, earphones uh, on, then uh, the question is, how do you not confuse this? Um, so run patiently would not really follow your, uh, let's say, achieve make you achieve your goals. So again, you need to to uh, kind of integrate that. And of course, it would, things are even worse for sensory motor uh, activity, where you, you keep uh, actively uh, processing several kinds of stimuli and several outputs at the same time. So that's can. Um, okay, as I have said, synchronization may be one way, but I'm not, that's, I'm not going there. Now, we investigated what that means and whether we can, uh, because people argue about binding is one of the hottest topics, and people are, can uh, argue for hours and days uh, whether it exists or not. So we just thought, let's, for, let's be agnostic here. Let's just look whether people do bind. Perhaps they don't need to, uh, but they may. Okay. So the idea being we presented stimuli, and then it's a pretty trip. Trismanian uh, approach uh, in, for, the, for the stimuli, but then I extend it to the to actions. Um, the idea is that if you present an X and an O, uh, they compete. Uh, so if these are the two stimuli that can appear, uh, you have to make a selection here. And if it's presented on the top or the bottom of the display, you also have to make a, a, a distinction here. And if I present one, one stimulus at an X or O at the bottom or the top or bottom, uh, so the X, for instance, at the top, you may bind these two features. And if you bind them, this should have after effects on the, on the next uh, part of the trial, where we asked, so we just presented this without asking people to do something with it, uh, but then presented another stimulus that people had to read, respond to. And they had to respond, for instance, to the shape. So whenever they see an X, they press left. Whenever they see an O, they press right. And we analyze this as a function of the feature repetition or alternation between uh, the, 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 these two parts of the trials. So this would be a complete repetition. You see the exact same stimulus in the exact same location, complete alternation, as it were, and there's a partial overlap. Now, what you can see in the findings is that uh, is this. This is a shape match and mismatch, location match and mismatch. And we typically get this. So don't, don't worry about the, the not imperfect symmetry that has to do with inhibition of return and so forth. But you typically can get a crossover effect in the sense that complete alternation and complete repetition are doing well. Okay. So yes, priming may or may not play a role, feature for simple feature priming, but that's not explaining the effect. The effect has to be explained by considering that the two partial repetitions somehow create a problem. So if you re repeat one feature but not the other, you're worse. Why? Well, because it increases, it introduces confusion. If it, let's say, the repeated feature reintroduces its old, old partner, then we know that for personal relationships, not good. <laughs> so um, we found that for many other uh, domains and, and, and uh, modalities and cross uh, modalities and so forth. So on. So we also looked into a uh, use fMRI to look at the brain. Uh, the idea being that if so, if these are hand measure uh, uh, movies. As you can see, here's a house moving in one di diagonal or the other, uh, and then uh, in the in the next. Uh, so that should lead to a binding between the house representing the house area and the motion, the motion area, a particular motion code. But if then the next stimulus shows a face moving, 
in a different direction, there should not be any problem because that is a complete alternation, as it were, as compared to the phase moving into the same direction than uh, uh, as the house. Because then the repetition of the motion should now retrieve the house, which now competes with the phase. So in other words, if we compare these two conditions in the brain, subtract one from the other, we should find increased house area activation. Uh, and this is indeed what we found. So if you, if you take a region of interest that you previously determined, uh, then you find increased house area activation uh, in, in one condition as compared to the other to repeat the motion. So indeed, you uh, reactivate the feature that previously has been bound to the repeated feature. You can find, basically, you can find the same for stimulus and, and response. So here we replaced one stimulus feature by a response. So you see again an X or O, you press left or right, uh, according, not, not in response to the X or O, but according to a preview. So we tell you, please press left, whatever the stimulus is, the first stimulus is, you press left, uh, and then, but nevertheless, you should bind the X to the left key press. And then here, the, the second response requires pressing left or right to the, the, the shape, for instance. Uh, then you have the same situation. You may have complete alternation, complete uh, 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 repetition that should be fine, but the partial repetition should be uh, problematic. And indeed, this is what you find. So you find the exact same effect. It's much bigger, uh, which I think has to do with the fact that responses have to do with location. Anyway, um, so same story, you get, can do the same logic, uh, apply the same fMRI to the same logic. I'm, I'm rushing through this. Uh, and basically what you find is that indeed, uh, if you uh, re repeat uh, a previous partner of the house, the house area gets more activated. And if you repeat a previous partner, let's say a previous co-occurring feature, be it a stimulus feature or a response of a phase, then you have increased activation, basically, summarizing the, the logic. Good. Um, how do you control this feature integration? Is that automatic? Is that, do we bind everything? How, do, do we, how does that work? Well, first we thought, oh, there must be some kind of control. We take that from research that we did on intentional blink. Uh, so here you see uh, the same uh, conditions, a typical intentional blink. Uh, situation, you present the stimulus in the same location, uh, and there are two targets. If the two targets are uh, uh, very close in time, then you are likely to miss the second. This is called the intentional link, uh, and the, 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 the drop is, is a representation of the, of the link. Um, and what we did was to use the same condition and embed it into different contexts. One context was the typical very fast uh, presentation of almost everything. So 80% of the trials were very fast uh, and 20% and were extremely slow, under challenging, dramatically under challenging. What should that do to people if they can control the, the window, the temporal window of their event files, the, the duration window? Well, they should be short, right? So that would mean that they would open our which should be likely to open two different event files for the two stimuli. Whereas in another condition we reversed the logic and presented 80% of the trials were embarrassingly embarrassing slow. So yet all the time this chamber and 20% were fast and this were the ones that we took to measure this. And what you can see here is that EEG uh, results for the fast group and the slow group and you see that indeed the fast group is basically doing stuff that we interpret as opening a new event, event file. So you have a, a, a electrophysiological correlate for, for, for producing this. So if that is true, the conditions were identical. The, the ones we, 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 we put into, we took, we integrated into these uh, uh, analyses are the same physically, but they're embedded into, into different contexts. So therefore, you must have some control. Uh, another uh, indication was that here we manipulate, obviously, uh, I manipulate the, the, the relevance of the feature in the second of the two of the, I always present pairs in these event file masks, and the second has an instruction as it were. The first is just flash and do nothing with it, and the second I give you an instruction, respond left to the location, to the, uh, the, the, the shape, 
uh, and, and write to one shape and write to the, the other. But you can, all, of course, instruct them differently. You can uh, let them respond to color, to location, to anything you want. And that makes a difference. So if this is the effect here between repeated and alternating the response, uh, then you see that if a form is, if shape is relevant, then repeating the shape is particularly, uh, let's say, important for producing the effect. Whereas color is less, color does nothing actually. If you reverse that in a, in a different experiment, if you make color relevant, then color binding between color and response is relevant, uh, but not so much the binding between uh, shape and response. Now, so currently making things red, a feature dimension relevant or not does have a strong impact on the effect and which features are involved in, which binding effects, uh, let's say, related to response and another feature we find. Same thing here for location and so forth and so on. So we thought, first we thought, oh, perhaps the binding is selective. Perhaps you emphasize some, let's say you have control settings, you say, oh, you know, you know what? Color is relevant, so I'm mainly looking at color. Uh, we in increase the gain of the colored bones, and therefore they pop up more strongly, and so they are more likely to be bound to the response, which is always active because you have to carry them out. Um, uh, and, and that so it might be the binding that is relevant. But I think we were wrong. Um, so we we also looked into all, all sorts of other effects that suggest, uh, let's say, that tone induced arousal didn't do much. Uh, having the tone to determine R, R1 doesn't do much. So whatever we try to play around with the tension with increasing or reducing it uh, didn't do much. So we thought, hey, um, that's strange. Uh, but this is even worse uh, for this uh, general the first idea. So we compared people with low and high IQ and we see that the, the, the shape of by uh, response binding uh, is the, the, the smallest in, in high IQ people. So would that mean that they are worse binders? Does that make sense? Hmm, didn't feel right. We looked into aging, uh, children, young adults, old adults, and what you can see is that the binding is much, binding effects are much stronger in young kids and old adults. That's counter to everything we know about aging and young uh, kids. So if, if anything, they should be Doing worse with binding stuff. Uh, ASD, another thing that is the people who are accused to be bad, bad binders, uh, showed the strongest effects uh, and more. Uh, so I'm getting back to that. So in any case, that was that was really not fitting the idea that that it is binding that is measured here. Uh, so the creation of the binding. Uh, and indeed, th there was another study that made me even even think more. That was a kind of complicated I'm rushing through this. A complicated EEG feedback, um, uh, a, a neurofeedback uh, study, where we wanted to have people increase their gamma, which Singer believes has to do with binding, uh, over their frontal cortex. First, we tried occipital; that worked as well. But uh, later, we found out that it, you actually uh, enslave the occipital uh, by the uh, frontal, so you can actually target the frontal right away, and that's what we did in this study. Uh, basically, we had one, uh, one group of, of people to give neurofeedback to increase uh, gamma uh, over their frontal cortex, whereas another uh, to increase beta uh, over their frontal cortex, which is not assumed to be related to binding. Okay, and we did that for eight sessions and measured before and after these kind of binding effects. And what you can see here is this. This is location response binding. So remember, location uh, is not relevant. And what you see pre-test to, pro to, uh, to post-test in the critical experimental group, uh, the effect is totally eliminated. So do you unlearn binding if you increase your gamma? Does that make sense? Not to me. The shape response binding, which is the only relevant one because you have to respond to shape and you have to carry out responses, that was unchanged through this. So it's not that you unlearn everything. So in any case, the, 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 and then, uh, well, we also did some TDCS supporting this and so forth and so on. But the, the general story here is that, well, wait a minute, of course, something that I could have known from the start, the effect as such, uh, cannot, there cannot be an effect if there has been no binding. Okay. 
that's clear. But there could be binding without producing an effect. Why? Well, because we rely on retrieval. If people bind but do not retrieve, we cannot have any effect. And so we don't know. If you have no effect, you don't know what happened. If you, if you get an effect, you know what happened. You have binding and you have retrieval. That's all you can say. But you cannot judge from the disappearance of or the not having of the effect that there has been no bind. So probably that's the, the overall picture for me now is that uh, there is no impact of any resource or any strategy, any intention on the binding. You bind everything all the time. But whether you do or do not retrieve, this is selective. And if you are smart, if you are not suffering from ASD, if you are a, a, a mid, let's say, a best functioning uh, young adult, uh, then you have the best control over the retrieval. Probably not over the phone. All right. And now, there, why would action here be a feature as an event? Well, that has a theoretical background, which has to do with hydromotor control. So, lots of James and others suggested that uh, basically you uh, you are controlling uh, self-produced outputs. Um, so, the idea is that you activate a motor neuron. Uh, that uh, activates a muscle, if you're a baby, let's say, uh, newborn or even before, uh, that activates uh, some action uh, and feeds back to uh, reafferent uh, codes like kinesthetic, but maybe visual or anything else. And the only story here is that you automatically create an association between the two co-activated neurons so that from that on you can anticipate, that is pre internally pre-activate the outcome uh, the expected outcome in order to uh, trigger the, uh, the motor path. Um, right, so uh, we, we played through this and I'm just rushing through this, this is a long time ago. You can uh, test that. For instance, you have people carry out free, freely chosen left or right key presses, but you present higher low pitch tones in response to that. Uh, that should lead to an automatic integration of the tone pitch and the action so that later on you could use the tone pitch to trigger, to cue the actions as it were, and this is exactly what you find. You find that in reaction lines and you find that in free choices. So even if I give you the, the tone and say, well, do whatever you want, you do not whatever you want, but you do more often uh, press the key that previously produced that the tone. Okay, other people have found that as well. We did, did, took that into uh, PET and fMRI, and indeed, if you have people run, run through this learning period and then present them with action effects, then uh, you get motor uh, areas active uh, that are uh, suspected to house uh, abstract action events, like the SMA. Um, so do, do people really use that themselves or do we need st external stimuli to trigger those uh, action effects? Uh, there, yes, there is evidence that they do. So we had people to uh, prepare to, pre uh, let's say, respond uh, with two facial or manual actions to the color of the stimulus. Uh, but they we pre queued the category of the, of the action, whether it is a facial action or a, a manual action, ahead of, uh, it, 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 before each trial, about seven, Plus jitter milliseconds, uh, sec uh, seconds, so that we had time to scan this time uh, during this uh, this time. And the idea was obviously that uh, if you prepare for facial action and you're really using these internal anticipations, then you should actually pre-activate the FMA, the facial area. Whereas if you prepare for motor action, you should do the same for the extra stride body area, which does not code for face. And that's indeed what you find. You find that for the left and for the right hemisphere. In both cases, so if you pre if you prepare for a face, a facial action like here, uh, it, the FFA is more activated than the EB, uh, the exercise body area, and the opposite is the case if you prepare for hand actions. Uh, so the story is like this: uh, you do have uh, you do code um, uh, expected action impacts in the in, in the perceptual cortex. Uh, you then. Uh, use hippocampal uh, activities, at least in these kind of, uh, of, of short-term ex experiments, to retrieve the connection with the action plan stored in SMA and the hippocampal. Now, uh, how do you get intentionality in this? Uh, so this is, goes back to actually to my uh, PhD uh, work. 
Uh, so we use the assignment uh, task um, uh, where we had a, an auditory assignment task where we presented people with a higher low pitch tone from a left or right loudspeaker and they had to press left or right as you would expect from the assignment task. Uh, so that would be compatible, this would be incompatible. Uh, but we, we, we added an, a visual effect so that whenever you press uh, the left key, you would flash a right light and vice versa. So that we could instruct people differently. We could tell them, well, whenever you, you hear low, then you press left. Or whenever you hear low, you flash right. Depending on whether the action is described with respect to the key pressing or to the light flashing. And that totally reverses uh, the assignment effect. So now it is uh, sensitive to, let's say, the, to the congruency between the tone and the, uh, the, the light flash, uh, and irrespect, more or less irrespect. It's, it's somewhat smaller that takes into account the, the fact that you still press on the left. We just disentangle that in other studies. All right, so how does that work in the model? Uh, well, the basic idea is the, 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 the action that is producing, it, the left key press action uh, that is also producing the right sound uh, can be coded in different ways that, so that you use, let's say, intention as attention to highlight the dimension you're interested in. And that gives features based and coded on this dimension stronger impact on response selection. Uh, so that if you code that as a left key press, it is the, the left a sound that triggers, that drives this and facilitates the action. Whereas if you re-describe it as the right light action, then it is the right sound that is driving this, the same action. So, uh, very recently, and now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just briefly flashing two recent developments that we use the model for to, to expand it uh, to, to the self. Uh, what, it, what is that? Well. Um, People argue, but we try to find out. First, I thought, no, we, we don't do self, okay? We, we do this, we do right, left, round, and self doesn't, doesn't fall out of that, okay? Not at all, we do simple stuff, okay? Let's keep it there. But then, well, colleagues were, were kind of pushing me, and then I thought, I, then I came across this cool paper on Greenwald and many other authors in psychology who basically said, well, how is the self represented? I said, yeah, that's, I, want, I want to know that. And they said like this. So there is, uh, now this is features, okay? There are uh, arguably more integrated, uh, more abstract than the one that I'm used to, but that shouldn't change the theory. So we should be able to, to kind of be bold and don't change anything and still see where, how far we get. So we are now engaging, and indeed I, I got some support from Buddha and David Hume, who say basically the self is a bundle of features that you are coding. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that, that should be me, okay. Good, um, so we, we, we treat the self as an object. Okay, that's bad, I know, but this is what we do. Uh, and we played with this, uh, and we're using the, this is Kema, uh, the, now back to China, but he was a former PhD student in, in Leiden. And he, he set that up, and we are playing with versions of the rubber hand illusion, so you know that. Everyone who does not know the rubber hand illusion, okay. So this is the virtual hand version of it. So you have it having your, your own hand hidden uh, below kind of box like that, and you have a data glove, and then you move it. We, 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 we measure the data glove movements and translate that into either synced or not synced activities of either a, a human hand looking thing on the screen, uh, but it may be also replaced by a cat's paw. Uh, or, or a, a, a balloon, if you open, close your hand and you have a balloon uh, uh, increasing or uh, reducing in size, it's producing the same effect. And it produces effects like in judgment. So you, you say, this is me who is producing an agency, or this is part of my body. And indeed, you are uh, increasing sweat if you I approach the balloon or whatever, with an injection needle, you start sweating. Uh, so people really take that uh, as uh, people in the rubber hand illusion version try to disentangle that. I can tell you all that falls apart if you use dynamic uh, uh, designs of that. Now agency and ownership are perfectly correlated and support and so on. So this is all the, the number of points that you need to correlate in order to know who is uh, that counts. 
Now, if you play this through, then uh, Sakuris and others have shown you can also do that for faces. We do a dynamic version of with faces. So basically, you're wearing a cap uh, and, and some extra sensors, and you're wiggling around with your head. You're free to move, relatively free to move. And then you see an avatar on the screen, sync, either synced or async. Uh, async meaning we delay the input by three seconds so that you really do not see any correlation between what you're doing and what the what the avatar is doing. And then you find the same effects. People think this is them uh, in some way, uh, and they are they are afraid if we approach the avatar with an injection needle and stuff like this. Uh, and and then we 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 basically thought well we we should be able to to play with uh, with with Treisman's, uh feature migration story. Right? She says that if you distract attention or make it that somehow you're not really focusing much, uh, then you may confuse features and buy, rebind them in different ways. Uh, so you may see a, a yellow X and a red O, but then you may report a, 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 a yellow O. Uh, so you're not, not, not making up stuff, but you're rebinding them. And why not having that between different people, if, especially if the other person becomes you? Now, what if this other person starts smiling? Should you not get into better mood? Yes, you do. Uh, here's the, we, we have a, a neutral face, uh, like, uh, like, like here, this is a neutral face, male, female, and this is a smiling face. Uh, so we match gender. So if you're male, you see male, female. Uh, and then you see that what's the, what's happening to the mood across the session. Well, first, you, everyone gets into worse mood, so somehow it's boring, or I don't know what happens. But you see one outlier, and this is the situation where you are have a, having a synced, uh, a, a synced avatar that starts smiling. If the if that happens, you become better as we measure by uh, by mood. Uh, uh, but that is not just a self-presentation effect, because you can also do what we did here. And, and, Creativity task that is sensitive to mood effects. Uh, so you're better if you are happy. And indeed, you're doing better. So obviously, you're not just reporting that you're happy, but you are more happy. Because the, as we argue, the feature migrated from the avatar to you. According to Jamesian ideal motor emotion theory, that makes perfect sense because you're reading out the cues that you assume represent you. Now, the last step in this uh, was, this is a, a, a young me, uh, many years ago, 73, I think. Uh, and because I didn't want to have, have anyone else involved in ethical issues, because we morphed that into a monkey. Uh, so you would be synced or not synced with this thing, with this avatar here. And after having been synced or not synced, the avatar moves into a monkey and then we do a raven an IQ test, and you're getting down. Okay, it's not a big effect, but we replicate that up to the, almost the perfect p-value. Uh, so you significantly uh, get, are less intelligent, but you get, you also have a gain, namely that, if you, if you see this, you are attributing, uh, you are attributing more empathy to animals, because you became one. Good. So this is just a, a pointer to my talk at, in, on Saturday. Uh, we also recently extended that uh, to make it more complete. So now we define goal, uh, goals as uh, different sets of criteria that, that may uh, differ in activity. There are different intentional weightings, as I explained. So this uh, determines the, the contribution of the feature dimension to the action selection process. These are event files standing here for different actions like right-hand action, left-hand action, uh, right-foot action in the context of grasping uh, uh, for a, a cup. Um, so you can do all of that with, with all these actions, but apparently uh, you, they differ in, let's say, how promising the outcome might be. So if this is more positive as compared to this, then you're more likely to pick that. And that is, uh, let's say, creates a competition between event files that is controlled by something that I did not go into that because of time reasons. This is what I mean call meta control. So you can determine, uh, but I will talk more on this uh, on Saturday if, you, if you're interested. Uh, so you can, uh, let's say, manipulate the impact of, of these inputs and the amount of competition between event files 
uh, through several factors like meditation, the kind of meditation, so for instance, open monitoring meditation makes you reduce the, the, the conflict between these event files uh, so that you, you accept more uncommon uh, outcomes, uh, whereas focused attention meditation does the opposite. Food has an impact on that. Uh, drugs have an impact on that, if, especially if they are dopamine, dopaminergic. As we have shown, food that has impact on dopamine uh, has an impact. Microdosing, as we just discussed, with has, which has an indirect in, impact through serotonin, uh, does something it, it actually increases both of these component processes. Uh, but that's my basic story. That's a summary you can read yourself. Thanks for your attention. So then, do you not face a, a uh, the question of how the binding effect? Well, my, my, my standard speculation, but I'm, I'm heavily biased because I had some uh, early uh, uh, contacts with the singer group. So I, 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 I do think that in one version or another, there are different ways to put this, but uh, synchronization, neural synchronization is likely to be one one, uh, let's say, medium of that. that. Of course, it is difficult to say what's the mechanism because then you may ask, but uh, if, uh, let's say, if features belong to the same event, uh, swing in the same rhythm as it were, and, and are in a different rhythm than other guys, uh, if that uh, works, how is that achieved? How can that happen? Then I think you're, you're facing questions uh, that, that was also, that, that's, that's why Treesman hammered on spatial selectivity as an, an, an input uh, criteria. So I think according to her idea, you would uh, have a, se a sequential aspect where you focus on all, only the features of one event, then do stuff, and this stuff could be the creation of sync, synchrony between the neural correlates. And then you focus on something else where the, you can do the same thing in a different phase. So that could, and indeed, I think there is something we also try to, to play around with this uh, spatial selectivity aspect uh, of hers, and uh, there is something to this, even in, the, in this extended uh, uh, story. Um, so that the combination of that would be my first guess, let's say, without having solid data to present that, that would make my point. Just, just to make a follow-up on that, because the synchrony thing is because one could then imagine that you, you could perhaps simply by um, flashing different stimuli yes. at different um, frequencies, yes. you could either make it easier or harder yes. to find. Could be. I mean, it depends on how you think that, uh, let's say, exogenous uh, rhythm produ production uh, translates into internal ones. We have evidence that sometimes that works, at least in the, in the receptor cortex. But uh, the question is how far that goes. Uh, we actually had one study where we, we, we have evidence that it goes pretty far, but that could not be replicated. So I'm, I'm not enthusiastic to talk about this. But uh, yeah, I, I think that, that, again, the details may matter. But, and, uh, but the, the general idea, yeah, I, I think I agree. Um, we'll take one quick question uh, just from the online community. And then we'll yeah, so we have one question uh, asking how we can understand serial event coding in a more multi-sensory context and uh, asking if you could discuss perhaps a little bit how our actions could modulate multi-sensory. Yes, we have done uh, many uh, studies on uh, about where we transferred the, the paradigms uh, that I briefly flashed the kind of uh, interaction stuff that I presented um, to other modalities, across modalities. Uh, so I think we did auditory and vision, uh, vision and touch, um, and, and more. Uh, so it all, all, all 
always works the same way. Uh, and indeed it should because uh, the, the idea is that the, the, what the senses should do is to provide information about the distal facts. And in, in, in that sense, um, it, it should not matter what modality the information is coming from. Uh, obviously, they differ with respect to the accuracy. Uh, let's say space is not, is, I mean, you get space from, from audition, but you, you better look uh, if you really want to know. Uh, so I, I think the weighting uh, of these, if you put them in direct contrast, the weighting is different and there are ample, I mean, there are many experiments uh, from the 50s, 60s, uh, showing that there is different differential weighting of the modalities depending on the on the re reliability that you assume. Uh, but apart from that, I think that should perfectly work in any modality. I was going to ask you to just flesh out a little more the um, very interesting theory you presented about uh, the links between IQ and um, lack of apparent binding. Yes. And it may be uh, due to um, healthy failure to, to over retrieve bound features that yeah. are not relevant. Yeah. Um, I, so I just really wondered if you could uh, flesh that out a little more. What exactly is the link? How does that relate to IQ? Oh, well, that's related to quite a number of other, so I could ramble on for hours. But uh, <laughs> to give you the nutshell, um, that is related to the, the, the previous. Uh, the last slide I actually showed you, uh, namely the, the we, we, we believe that, oh no, sorry, that's the wrong direction. It's even worse. Okay, this one. So what, what, what we, we think is that basically meta control is in a nutshell, it's working like this. If you, so what is the, what are the basic ingredients of biologically plausible decision making? There are two ingredients according to this. Uh, there's a nice takes overview in 2007. Uh, and the, the idea is that to, number, number one, there is competition. So the brain is competitive. So whenever you increase the probability for one, you, you others lose. It's a winner takes all story. Not quite, but anyway, it's close. Uh, and the other is top down input, namely that whatever your goals whatever goal is, whatever your intention is, and whatever, but stuff that is uh, consistent, more consistent with your current goals, are getting some kind of support, top-down support. This is uh, bias competition, as Duncan would, would call it. Now, our question was, how can you individual, how can you introduce into individual differences in this that we call, according to the story that I, I, I'm explaining, that varies on one dimension between persistence and flexibility. And the idea is simple, that the amount of top-down support and the amount of competition, the competitiveness, as you can see here, if this is comp the competition between them, if you are moving towards persistence, then you are increasing this. So that means that you're becoming a black and white person, so you want to be sure, either this or that. If you are moving towards flexibility, you say, well, what the hell? I mean, why not X and Y? And can be difficult if it comes to relationships, but uh, it can be fun as well. Uh, and so the idea, and you can use that in, in uh, creativity tasks. So we, did, we distinguish between convergent thinking, where you have one highly defined solution, and, uh, and divergent thinking, where many things are possible. And what you then see is that convergent thinking, if it correlates, it correlates with IQ. So in, in that sense, high IQ measures, I think, to some degree, persistence, focusing, strong competition, either or, single channel thinking. Whereas flexibility, like artists, like the mad people that we, so how we sometimes call it, but they can be extremely creative, but creative in a different way. They don't think through things through that much, but so this is why it, it makes sense to be highly selective to distinguish between what is relevant and what is not relevant in this task for a high IQ person. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're always better. That depends on the task. This will be uh, probably our last question. Okay, I think that's my critique of the learning here in a way. We're talking about the association, fashion, and perception. 
Same mind if they just try. 